All right, well, let's get started. So I'm Noah Judson, uh, lead developer at CoinBeyond. We're a startup in Bellingham working on uh, blockchain and Bitcoin and making really easy to use payment systems for Bitcoin. So we have a point of sale system where somebody can ring up an order and then uh, pay for it in Bitcoin. We have an Android app that does that also. And um, an Android app that's also a wallet. And um, we have a big commerce integration. So there's about 70,000 stores online that use BigCommerce to set up their online store. And you can integrate Bitcoin with CoinBeyond uh, in about four minutes through BigCommerce. Um, and uh, well, let's get started. This is an introductory course. It's a beginner level um, getting into blockchain development. And so we have a wide array of um, people and knowledge about Bitcoin here. And so I'm going to try to do my best to satisfy everybody's wants and needs about um, learning about Bitcoin. If anybody ever has any questions, go ahead and feel free to speak up um, and interrupt me. Um, so we'll go into how the blockchain works, getting started, so downloading it, getting it set up so you're actually running a node, and then getting rolling, what you can do, talking with the Bitcoin daemon, and then we'll go into additional tools and resources and interesting projects going on. So again, interrupt me for any quick points, clarifications, opinions, etc. Pull the screen down. What's that? Pull the screen down. Well, actually, I'm going to be drawn on the board a whole bunch. So um, I'm going to be talking about the blockchain first. If anybody wants to go ahead and get started downloading the blockchain, uh, you can download the code from here, bitcoin.org slash en slash download. Um, there's some setup nodes instructions here, and we'll come back to this page. Um, and if you're downloading the blockchain, take days if you don't use a torrent file. Um, so find the bootstrap.dat torrent file, place it in your .bitcoin directory, and uh, one of those torrent files is available here. So why use Bitcoin? Bitcoin is an interesting piece of technology. Um, it was a breakthrough in distributed consensus. So you have uh, computers everywhere across the world. How do you get them to agree on the state of one thing? So a direct example for Bitcoin is it handles money. Uh, it handles transfer of value. So you know if this person is A and this person is B, and we're all sharing a distributed ledger, uh, like a bank account balance, something that says, you know, A has 50 bucks, B has 30 bucks. How do you prevent um, someone like B being malicious and saying, well, actually, I don't have 30 bucks, I have 30 million bucks. Um, and so this is what Bitcoin saw. This is the breakthrough of the blockchain. Um, with Bitcoin, things are faster, cheaper than banks. It's faster because banks typically typically take about two days to process a transaction. Um, there's many reasons for this. Um, they're just kind of slow. They've been around for thousands of years, running a lot of the same practices for those times. And even in the internet age, they still have antiquated methodologies. Uh, Bitcoin is really banking for the internet. Um, so transactions, if you don't consider them instantaneous, uh, you might want to wait for a transaction or two, especially for very large value items. Um, but even then, it's about 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes for three confirmations, uh, which is very solid in Bitcoin. And um, you know, compare that to banks, that is days faster. Um, and it's cheaper too. Banks, uh, typical, you know, if you're doing like a uh, ACH deposit, it'll probably be like 15 cents or so. Uh, with Bitcoin, just to transfer money anywhere, everybody has direct access to the blockchain, anybody can do it, um, and you have to pay a miner's fee, but it costs about a penny or two. And sometimes it can be free, depending on which Bitcoin you're sending. Um, another reason why Bitcoin is interesting, in my opinion, I was, I was talking about my interest in financial policy earlier. Um, Bitcoin is really like, Bitcoin is, most of the governments in the world are letting Bitcoin happen. They think it's an interesting technology. 
I think it's an interesting um, way to transfer value. And it's also interesting in that it's deflationary. There will be a set number of Bitcoin, about 21 million, about 100 years from now. Um, and it's being mined slowly. Compare that with the US dollar, which has about 40 billion new dollars printed every month. That's the quantitative easing. It's also happening in Europe. And so what this does is it inflates the monetary supply. And that means that there's just more dollar bills circling around. But the, the value then goes down. If there are more bills, then the value of each bill goes down. And so that's what inflation does. Um, Bitcoin, even though it's being printed right now, so right now it's inflationary, the concept of it being defined at what rate it will be created and when it will level off and when no more will be created sets up an interesting financial policy where nobody has control over it. Nobody can dictate, uh, okay, we need to go to war. We need like 40 billion more dollars to go send to the troops and to pay for armaments and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there's, there's a lot into that. Uh, and for time's sake, let's move on. Yeah. Uh, what is it that prevents there from being more Bitcoin? Is that just built into the, into the algorithm that just can't go beyond? Good question. It's built into the code of Bitcoin. Okay. And it's open source, so everybody has access to it. And everybody who runs um, a node or a, a miner runs that code. And so I'll get into it, the consensus model. but. Um, what it would take for there to, to push beyond that limit is an edit to a piece of very low level code in Bitcoin that people are, at least right now, very vehemently for this set limit of Bitcoin. To increase that would be to um, take away a lot of the value of Bitcoin. And so it'd be, I think, an insurmountable effort to try to get around that. So this distributed consensus model that I was talking about allows computers all over the world to agree on one thing. And for Bitcoin, that's a distributed ledger. And so a ledger is just transactions. So we'll say A, oh no, A paid B, um, you know, 1.6 Bitcoin. B paid C, 1.3 Bitcoin etc, etc, etc. And this list goes on and on and on. In Bitcoin right now, it's dozens of gigabytes. And so all that data, distributed consensus, everybody in the world agrees on it. Um, and why does everybody agree on it? Yeah. Oh, what namespace do A, B, and C come from? How are they identified? Are they public keys? Sure. Addresses? Yeah, so... These are public keys, which are in the form of addresses. And so um, these, a lot of things in Bitcoin are hashed, usually hashed twice. And so there's like a SHA-256 hash and then a write-160 hash on that. And so A is represented, usually the Bitcoin addresses start with a one if it's a regular blockchain network. And so it could be one B, C, A, nine, capital Z, lowercase r, da da da, you know, n to x. And this would be about 30 to 34 characters long. And so that's just an address, an address specifying um, kind of like an account. Um, and somebody can have however many addresses they want. For every address, there's an associated public key and an associated private key. Uh, and that private key is what allows you to send these transactions. And so you are the only one who has access to that private key, hopefully. Um, and by signing those transactions with your private key, you're saying, yes, I am the one who did it. So this distributed consensus model, um, like I said, allows for everybody to agree on one thing. And how this works is complicated and we'll eventually arrive at it. <clears throat> All 
I think we'll first start with these nodes and peers. Um, so we'll say each of these are a node in the network. And everybody in the world is on the same Bitcoin network, um, at least in this case. And so they're all um, sending transactions to each other. So, you know, a transaction gets sent to here, it's a peer to peer network. And so they distribute these transactions to each other, to their connections. So B might send A transaction and it might propagate through the network to get to everybody. So these transactions are just floating around. And then certain ones called miners, let's say D is a miner. Miners are helping verify transactions um, and then trying to solve a difficult problem to do a sort of proof of work to, um, to make it another insurmountable challenge to fool the rest of the network into fraudulent transactions. So how that works is when a miner is mining, it takes a whole bunch of the transactions that are floating in its mempool. And so this, you know, it, it could be a hundred different transactions. It takes them, and basically what it does is it tries to hash them all together with some random nonsense, nonsense to get them below a certain difficulty level. And so if the difficulty is really hard, the final hash has to be less than that really low difficulty number. So this hash could be like, uh, you know, zero, 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 zero. And you know, it goes on and on. But what it has to do is this final hash, which can't really be predicted, can only be run and then tested, needs to be below this number. And so these miners are running very specialized hardware to run hashes over and over again very fast. So this miner is doing it, and let's say A is a miner and they're doing it too. So they're competing every 10 minutes about to get the next block. And what that means is when somebody finally gets a hash that's below that difficulty, they can take all the transactions that were within it, make it a block, basically, and then distribute it back to the other nodes. And so this is the block. Everybody else does a quick verification to make sure it's legit. And then that block of transactions goes onto the blockchain. And this blockchain is a what it sounds like. It's a list of these blocks of transactions that had to be very brute force computed to get that hash below the difficulty. And some interesting things about these um, blocks is that the algorithm in Bitcoin tries to make it so a block is created every 10 minutes. And so it analyzes the network figures out, okay, people are getting these blocks in about nine minutes, let's increase the difficulty a little bit. Or people are getting these blocks in like 12 minutes, so let's decrease the difficulty a little bit. I think that happens every two weeks. And so the Bitcoin network is constantly adjusting itself so that a block is created every 10 minutes. Now these guys are doing a lot of work, and so they get paid for their work. Just, um, so whenever these new blocks are created, right now they get 25 Bitcoin. So that is a lot of money. Um, but don't go trying to mine on your own. There's probably a billion dollars worth of miners out there in the world, and you're not going to compete with them on your own. Uh, what you can do is join a large mining pool but even then, if your pool wins, you'll get a very, very small share of that winning. So I generally say stay away from mining, um, unless you just want a space heater. But, uh, <laughs> but if you want to get into it, there are places where you can research and learn uh, and invest some money into trying to win those.
now the hardware is all specialized. Yeah, I was going to say, do people still use GPUs or is it only ASICs now? I believe it's only ASICs. Yeah. But if someone mines, they could. Yeah. So the miners are verifying the blockchain for creating them and they're getting paid for this. And as you said, there's a finite amount of Bitcoins getting created. Yeah. So when we hit that point, what's the point of miners continuing to do this work? And will Bitcoin fail at that point because no one's creating blockchains? Thank you for asking that. Um, so these guys are getting rewarded. Now, when we you know, say, okay, we're done producing Bitcoin, how are, how are these miners gonna be incentivized to protect the network? Um, and how that works right now is, well, this 25, it didn't always used to be 25 Bitcoin. Uh, it used to be a lot more and it gets halved every something like 200,000 blocks. Um, and so it used to be like 100 Bitcoin, and then 50 Bitcoin, now 25 Bitcoin. And then depending on how fast the next blocks are mined, I believe the next one is set for the middle of next year, where it's gonna go down to 12 and a half Bitcoin. And so what this does with the number of Bitcoin ever mined, is it goes like this, where this is time on the bottom axis, this is, 2009, that's right, right? <laughs> uh, as it goes on, I think 2140 is when the last Bitcoin is gonna be mined. And so it's not exactly 21 million. I can't remember if it's just under 21 million or just under 22 million, but we'll say 21. It's an arbitrary number because it's the value of each Bitcoin that matters. Uh, and so we're about actually right around here. Not made to scale, but here we are, I think at about two thirds. Bitcoin is already mined. And so it's gonna keep getting halved, and keep going on. Now these miners, to get back to your question, these miners not only incentivized on the creation of new Bitcoin, they're incentivized on miners fees. And so they're like, Thank you, Miner, for protecting the network. I haven't got into yet, but thank you, Miner, for protecting the network. Here's a transaction. I'm gonna, um, you know, this transaction from B to C that was 1.3 Bitcoin. Miner, I'm also gonna give you 0 0.0002 Bitcoin. And that's to incentivize the Miner to be like, oh, he's gonna give me 0 0.002 Bitcoin. I'm gonna include him in my next block. And so when he wins the block, that 0 0.0002 Bitcoin goes from B to D, the miner. And so everybody sends little miners fees. And when a whole bunch of people are doing it, it actually adds up to something significant. In the future, we're not quite sure how it's gonna go, but hopefully there'll be so many people using the blockchain, miners fees can still be very little. If there's not very many people using the blockchain, the miners fees are gonna be very high to encourage um, continued mining because it costs so much money to do it. Yeah. Wasn't the whole requirement in on the value of the Bitcoin remain high as if your if there's a finite amount and the transaction fees are paid to the winning miner, but the difficulty of increases over time, then more hardware will be required to for the uh, for the blocks. Mm -hmm. So if the price doesn't remain high, then there would be an incentive for people to keep in mind with it. Um, it's a complicated market like that. Uh, if the price you know completely collapses and they're not getting enough miners fees, yeah, we would see a whole bunch of mining operations just shut down because they're not profitable. But what that would also do is decrease this difficulty level because so many close down. And so it actually make it so maybe that, you know, you or I could start mining again. And so even though, yeah, they're shutting down, but it becomes cheaper for Bitcoin network to keep mining. Yeah. 
have a question about the difficulty level adjustment. So there's no centralized authority deciding this level, right? Right. So does that mean that each individual miner is taking a look at how often he's receiving uh, new blocks, and based on that rate, each miner is deciding the difficulty level that they're using? Yeah, it's, it's actually part of the Bitcoin code that runs on all of these machines. Um, that everybody says, okay, here's the next difficulty level. So if someone tries to, to cheat the system and says, oh, I did it, I got under the, big, under the difficulty level, and this was the difficulty level, it's you know higher than everyone else's. Everybody else is gonna see that and be like, that's BS, I'm not gonna accept that block. And it will be included in the blockchain, and so it's as if that person never even mined that, because they faked the result. Yep. Are you yelling in the woods? Right, right. Yeah. So, not an expert on this, but all this is based on hashing and private keys and so forth. Yeah. Quantum technologies yes. are good at, are supposedly going to be good at circumventing all that right. and making it easy. Mm -hmm. And we'll probably have that by 2140. Yeah. So, how does that play into this? Then we switch our hashing algorithm okay. to something so that is quantum resistant. Okay, so they anticipated that. Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. In fact, that was a question I had. There's a crypto term that I forget, the protocol flexibility, protocol adaptability. Mm -hmm. Things can be replaced with new safer versions of Bitcoin. Yes, so the Bitcoin core, that's what it's called. Bitcoin core code is always being updated. Um, there's a handful of core developers who are paid by like the Bitcoin Foundation or they're paid you know, sponsored by another Bitcoin company. And anybody can actually help, but there's only a handful of main core developers. Core developers are now on MIT's payroll. Yeah, so thank you. This week. Yeah. Um, and so, oh, what was the question again? The uh, protocol adaptability. All oh, right, protocol adaptability. So they're constantly updating it. I think right now we're on 0 0.10 um, something. And that's constantly being updated, and um, you know, people adopt the new code and then run that. And it's all open source, so everybody can review the changes. Um, and so what, that, what we can do is, you know, the core developers that get together and say, hey, you know, I heard my colleague just developed a new quantum hash break algorithm. Uh, I think we really need to get this fix out before my colleague publishes paper. And so, um, you know, they'll talk on the IRC channels and I'll coordinate and talk with the miners too because the miners are usually a little slower to update because they're running more specialized software. Um, so they'll get them, get everybody to buy in on the change and then everybody does it. Um, and so this guy right here could be running 0.10, this one could be running 0.9, this one 0.8, etc. Um, but the core rules of Bitcoin pretty much remain the same. Uh, and if there's ever a <coughs> big, big change that is incompatible with old versions, I think what would be required is a hard fork. Yeah. And that I would say, you know, after this point, um, you know, you have to be using Bitcoin version 1.12 or higher. And so what will happen is so we'll say two blocks were mined, this one with 1.12 and this one with old ones. Um, blocks will keep getting mined by different people in the network and different people will accept um, their preferred versions. But the one that wins out, the one that remains the longest is the one that wins. So there's actually, there's always possible that we could have um, multiple chains going on, but whichever is the longest one is the one that everybody accepts. Um, and then you could customize the new code to only accept these versions and just you know kick out the old versions automatically. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, just back to the protocol adaptability and the sort of automatic adaption of difficulty based on the feedback received through the network. Uh -huh. So does that then go into the 51 cent problem that I've heard of? Modify either the um, 
cipher being used or, or change the difficulty yourself and because you own a significant stake in the network validate it to a point where it is proven to be true? Um, I don't know if you could change the difficulty or if it even be necessary in a 51% attack. So first I have to preface with the 51% attack is this uh, attack on Bitcoin, the blockchain, that says if you control over 51% of the blockchain network, then you control the transactions. Um, it's not quite true. It's somewhat of an overhyped problem. Um, but how it basically goes is this. If you want to double spend, so say um, E is paying A for a brand new car. And so they're gonna pay them $60,000 in Bitcoin. So the Bitcoin equivalent of this. Um, and so they pay it to A, and A gives E the car and E drives away. Um, simultaneously, E spends, uh, well, let's say, he goes to E2. Uh, well, this diagram is not quite accurate, but I'll we'll try to get the point across. Uh, so he actually sends, uh, in another duplicate transaction, this $60,000 worth of Bitcoin to E2, uh, which belongs to E. It's just another one of E's addresses. So he sends two transactions to the Bitcoin network, one for $60,000 worth to A, and one for $60,000 worth of the same Bitcoin to E2. Um, and then because he owns so much of the network, he starts mining as fast as he can, and he wants this transaction to get into the blockchain, but not that one. And so he's fooling A into giving him a car and just moving the money to E2. It's a double spend, um, and you need to be very powerful in the network to be able to do that. You need to beat all the other miners in the system to get this transaction in the next block, mine the next block, put it on the blockchain, and then start stacking other blocks on top of that to make sure that's cemented in. Um, but it's extremely hard to do. Even with 51% control of the network, you have 51% chance of getting the next block. Getting two blocks in a row, it's more like 25%. Um, and it's just incredibly resource intensive to pull off and not worth it actually for any, for anything really, because it costs hundreds of millions of dollars. Well, they know who did it too. Yeah, yeah, you'd be able to find <laughs> it right away. <laughs> yeah. Oh, which brings up my question, which is, are attacks detectable if the NSA secretly decided to cause no object? They want to destroy faith in the Bitcoin network. Yeah, could they pull that off with long haul? Long haul? Which is their cryptography breaking supercomputer. <laughs> um, I don't know too much about that. Um, anybody want to speak up? <laughs> I don't know, some helicopters coming in. <laughs> um, I would guess not. Um, the Bitcoin um, Bitcoin is used by hackers all around the world and in black markets around the world to securely transfer money over the internet and money is like the most solid reward a hacker can have um, for completing their hack um, this Bitcoin is just like money sitting there and, and hackers will try to break into people's computers to get it um, but it has not been broken. It has withstood the test of six years of hackers around the world trying to break it. it hasn't worked. Um, it's actually, it's one of those just crazy things that people thought, this isn't gonna work. Satoshi Nakamoto was, uh, who invented Bitcoin. Um, he was like, you know, his arguments were thrown out. It's like, no way, no, you can't make it, you can't make Bitcoin work that way. You can't make digital money work that way. It doesn't work. But then he built it and then showed the world. Gradually, people started using it. Hackers tried to get into it, but no one was able to. So what about the scalability? The scalability is um, an issue, but it's not an issue at the same time because it's being worked on. Yeah. Gavin Anderson, so one of the scalability things is 
these miners are actually incentivized to use less transactions in their block to keep less transactions because when they find a block, they want to distribute it to the rest of the network as fast as they can. And they can do that with a 100 kilobyte block faster than a 5 megabyte block. Um, Gavin Anderson, <coughs> one of the core developers, um, has developed some a way to make block distribution time the same regardless of size of the block to help those miners fit as many transactions as blocks as they can. So it's not just cache locality being different, but rather the hash block part for every 512 byte. Okay, so that's a tough shot to show one way. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think scalability is it's an issue right now, but it shouldn't be an issue soon. Yes? Is there a minimum block size? I don't think it's enforced. I think so I've seen them with like one. Just, they, they could be hashing one transaction, call it a block, and ship it out like everybody's cool. Yep. Huh. Yep, they want that 25 Bitcoin. Right, right. Okay. Really, really bad. Yeah, they're not really helping the network, but it happens. Um, I should probably move on. So, um, we're just getting to blocks. We did blocks, transactions. Um, they're pretty simple. A transaction is basically, um, it takes something like this and then um, something like this and puts it together. So a transaction, we'll say, to describe this transaction from B to C, 1.3 Bitcoin, you'd have a transaction, it'd have a hash, it'd have um, internal scripting in this transaction that gets sent so everybody can verify it. And it's actually um, a very limited type of scripting code um, that is used by all the miners and all the verifiers to process transactions. And so here's one, it's op dupe, op hash 160, here's a hash, and then op equal verify, op check sig. And it does that in a stack, so it puts it puts these on a stack, runs each, um, <coughs> I guess, word of code um, with the appropriate parameters, and I don't have time to get into it. Um, but it, so this, this, this very limited code um, gets sent along with each transaction. Most transactions are exactly the same with things like multi-sig, um, they could be more complicated. And so that allows, this is actually, if you want to develop on the blockchain, like on, on the blockchain, learn this stuff. But that's actually pretty advanced. Um, so to go into transactions, um, we'll have a hash, we'll have the, uh, that code, and we'll have transaction inputs and outputs things that um, the other things can verify. And so this input will be this A to B for 1.6 Bitcoin. And these are actually addresses. And then B to C of 1.3 Bitcoin would be a V out. So it's say it's going to take 1.3 of this And then it has to use all the inputs. So where do the rest go? Well, they probably go to a change address for B, um, which, so like if you um, are paying for a coffee and it costs 350 and you hand them a five, a dollar 50 comes back to you. So the change right here, which would be 0 0.3 Bitcoin, would just go into one of these addresses. And all of these A, B, C, or yeah, A, B, B1, B2, C, those are all addresses. What if they're just not right now? Yes, there'd be a fee. Um, and that would be, if if this change was not presented right here, this 0 0.03 Bitcoin, then the miners would assume that is their fee. And so that's a mistake a lot of people have done, um, <laughs> where they give the miner that much Bitcoin for processing the transaction. Yeah. 
There's lots of these old clients that allowed me to not set an output address. Yeah. So um, getting started with the blockchain, that's where you go to download it. You can go to GitHub and build it yourself, check out the code. Um, setting up the node instructions, so a node is any one of these guys. Um, it's a Bitcoin daemon that's talking to other peers, processing transactions, sending them to each other. It's not a miner. I personally haven't set up a miner, so don't ask me. But uh, I'm sure other people in the room have. Raise hand if you've set up a miner before. There's who to talk to. Um, <laughs> um, and then setting up your node, um, you have to edit this bitcoin.conf file. And so this is just in the root directory of your Bitcoin directory. Um, and here's all the parameters, a, a URL, a couple URL for what parameters to use. Um, the basics of what you need are RPC user and RPC password. I like to put print the console on there. Um, and if you use TX index, you'll want to do that before you download the blockchain. What it does is it indexes all the transactions um, so that you can you know, say, where is this transaction? What block is it in? And it keeps a database of, oh, this transaction is in block 100,962. Um, and if you don't do TX index, it won't do that. So that can be very useful in crawling the blockchain um, or just querying to certain parts of it really quickly. Uh, if you do that, you need to run reindex equals one. And you do that when you're running Bitcoin D. Um, and if you are developing, you probably want to say testnet equals one or regtest equals one. And so testnet is the same thing as Bitcoin, but with play money. And so everybody around the world is using play Bitcoin money um, instead of real Bitcoin. And reg test is the Bitcoin network is just all right there on your own local system and you can process blocks really quickly. So Bitcoin core, which is the code um, from that website I was just showing you. That has Bitcoin D in it, Bitcoin Daemon, Bitcoin command line interface, um, and Bitcoin QT, which is the GUI interface for Bitcoin. So running Bitcoin D, you'll see something like this, where it's setting up. For Linux, it's often your, your home Bitcoin directory, is usually in home, your username, dot Bitcoin. Um, and if you're going to do it, remember that uh, I think it's over 40 gigabytes now. I, I use an external hard drive for it. Um, you just want to make sure you have enough space for it. So isn't that part of the scalability issues? It's not making that so big? That's what pruning is I mean, it obviously for. has to continue growing. But. So that's what pruning is for. I read something recently. They've merged some feature in which means you can actually run a node, not a miner. I mean, it's obviously going to have some limitations that okay. we'll only use, I think he said, like, a gig or and a half. Okay, so when I use the gig, that's the whole thing. And yeah. And I mean, I still that. have the whole thing on mine. I just recently saw something relating to that. I don't know the yeah. whole details. Yeah, Merkle tree pruning is right in the Bitcoin paper. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's what we thought about that one. Yeah. Um, there's also... Um, Bitcoin services you can use. So you can talk to other people running nodes um, without having to download the whole blockchain yourself. And there's light wallets you can use. Um, so in addition to online services, you can use something like Electrum, which then talks, which is a Bitcoin wallet that talks to other nodes that, that um, have the whole blockchain installed. So I'll just show you guys a few Example things in Bitcoin D real quick. Um, so over here, I am running the blockchain network, Bitcoin D, and it's constantly making connections, dropping connections with other peers, 
Uh, it looks like I'm connected to about 13 other peers. Uh, it shows their IP addresses, whatnot. The code that they're running is 10.1. Um, and then when we get new blocks, it'll let me know right here. And um, if you're waiting for like a transaction to be verified, then you can verify that it's been um, verified. And so that was just running it, Bitcoin D. It can then use a Bitcoin CLI to do something like get balance. And so Bitcoin D has a wallet in it. I personally um, wouldn't recommend it. I think that there's better wallets. This was the first one. It's a really basic one. Um, more so, this code is about having a node. And so this is a fresh, fresh wallet. I don't have any Bitcoin in it. And that's a good point right there. It shows my balance in this many zeros. Because it's a digital currency, we don't have to be limited by what's um, you know reasonable within a pocket. Bitcoin goes to the 100 millionth decimal place. So that's eight decimal places. So you don't have to buy, right now a value of one Bitcoin is like 230 bucks. You don't have to buy one whole Bitcoin. You can buy even, well these services won't allow it, but you can have 100 millionth of a Bitcoin. And that would cost much, 100 millionth of a Bitcoin. What's that? Less than a penny now. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think most online services, if you try to buy it online, Coinbase is a really nice, easy way to buy it online. You hook up to your bank account. Um, I think the minimum they'll do is like $2. Worth of Bitcoin? Yeah. So with the CLI, you, I guess you can kind of query your history of transactions, right? Or is that yes. And what does it show in the transaction? Yeah, let's do that. Okay. Um, let's see. Bitcoin, CLI, I think get best block. Okay, let me look at the APIs real quick. So here is a very handy website that shows the API calls list. And you can interface this. Uh, it's over HTTP, um, RPC, and JSON. Um, or you could just use the Bitcoin CLI. And so I think get best block hash. So this will get us the latest block. So there's our hash. So we'll copy that, and then it's probably get block, yeah? So there's, uh, let me print that to file. So here's the output of the latest block. So it has, it has a hash for the block says how many confirmations are where. It's the latest block, so just one. Um, and that just means how many blocks are there on top of it. We got the size, um, the height. This is the 353,684th block. Uh, we have a Merkle root. And this is a list of all the transaction hashes that are included in it. So we'll page them down. A lot of transactions. We got a time, we have the nonce used in it, and the bits, difficulty level, um, chain work, and previous block hash. So then you can go from each block to the previous one, um, and when the next one comes, you'd have a next block hash. Is that chain work also a shot one? Because that's incredibly just a lot of zeros. <laughs> Yeah, honestly, I'm not sure what the chain work is. <laughs> Does anybody know what that is? Google it's it pretty quick. impressive, all those zeros. That's really a shot one. Yeah. Well, it, it, that could be what it is. Um, yeah, there's, there's mining farms um, full of miners, more powerful that can, like, like one of them can do it better than your GPU. Um, and there's warehouses full of these things constantly on the Bitcoin. All over the world, only one wins every ten minutes. Like everyone's getting interested in it. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know anything like hard facts on that, but uh, I hear that China and India are interested in um, trying to manipulate the market um, and trying to mine Bitcoin because they see its future work. How do you little Eastern European country that recently seceded that made from its parent country that made Bitcoin its official currency? <laughs> So I'm going to take this random transaction and we're going to say Bitcoin CLI get raw transaction. Uh, I'm going to paste this hash and it takes one more parameter which is verbose and say one and here's all the data in that transaction. So here's where it started. So we have the hex that represents all the transaction, and then all of the rest of it is that hex decoded. Um, so we have that transaction ID. Here's the VN, which is right here, talking about its inputs. And so it says, I have an input from this transaction ID, another one. Um, and then, yeah, where's the mount? Scroll down, and then we say we are outputting 1.65 Bitcoin. Um, here's that the code to run the transaction. And there's this destination address. And then here's another output to another address. Yep, probably a change address. Uh, I believe the mining fee is unspecified outputs. So it's not explicitly um, stated. Um, but all of the inputs can be read from up here. Uh, and you'd have to look at these transaction IDs to see what those amounts are. Yeah? I'm still a bit confused. Where did the change coming from? The change? Yeah, you say that it has a change output. So from the previous transaction? Yeah, so um, so one block. Right. So if I if I get this right, your balance, uh, B's balance, because A gave B uh, one point six Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And in that same block, B gave C one point three Bitcoin. Point three is the difference between those. That B uh, has it keeps so that they paid so, out. So if there's a transaction from A to B and B never does another transaction anywhere in the blockchain, you should never have any change. I, that's sound good. Okay, because it was just the way the example I gave may be a little wrong, but the one you said the point three change, and that was because B gave the C, but I was thinking that if it was A gave the C and then So change addresses exist, or or just these you know change output transactions exist, so that you don't have to give somebody, you don't have to transfer all the input to a single destination. So every transaction has inputs, and you have to use all of the inputs in your transaction. So in this case, this transaction I was describing, this was the input. And so 1.6 Bitcoin, all of it had to be used. And so, but he only, B only wanted to pay C 1.3. And so he just sends 0.3 of that to another one of his addresses to, to spend all of it. So but these are already spent transactions into one transaction. Basically the, ba the books have to be balanced in the block. Yeah. And so for the books to be balanced in the block, um, B is going to have 0.3 Bitcoin more uh, 
than the one point, or more than the one point three you spent. So when you create a wallet, you have to create essentially two accounts. You have to create the account you're putting money out from, and then the change account where the change goes to. Correct. Um, uh, typically, you have infinite yourself. Infinite you can set yourself account. as your as your change address. So okay, so you just essentially have a balance of yourself. Mm -hmm. Do you know why um, the is the the block needs to you know balance all of that? Yeah, why every transaction needs to spend all its inputs? Can't remember off the top of my head. No. But I, I think it keeps it things simple. Yeah, yeah. You, only, you only have to go one step back to look up those two in transaction how much money is there. That's that way they're not all you, know, you don't have them to go back to there, back to there, back to there. So that makes sense. So, just one, one, so, so this is only important if the single entity does more than one transaction in the chain. The balance. Yeah, and often they do. Well, if I do one transaction to one payment, and then I don't make another payment until the train is done, I've only done one transaction. So if you only had the, in the transaction of the chain, if only A gave to B, mm -hmm. is that considered spending all of his input? Um, so when A gave B 1.6 Bitcoin, A had to have 1.6 Bitcoin already. In his wallet, but it's not in the chain. It is in the chain. So if anybody, in the chain. If anybody uh, has any Bitcoin, it's in the blockchain. Okay. The point is the only way to split up an amount is to use change. So in the previous, yeah, the previous block, A received 1.6 Bitcoin. And with that block that he received at 1.6, he can't spend 1.3 of it. He has to spend the entire amount and then change back the remainder. And so this is how you split the money up. And when you combine it, you have to combine previous blocks. And there can still be change that you can specify exact amounts. But in order to specify exact amounts, you have to specify the change in the block. It doesn't automatically calculate that for you. The miners will, but they'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> Where's your motivation? Yes. Twenty bucks on the ground. <laughs> yeah. How does it ever get combined back together again? It doesn't it just cause ever increasing entropy over time and lots of little fractional pieces. Get this together. actually prevents that from happening. Who, who, who can no, mine? You can send all those small amount to one. Yes. Yeah, whenever you're setting an amount, you set an amount from a specific block. Or I guess you can set it from multiple blocks, but you probably reference the exact block that you're sending it, that you that you receive that money. And the, the balance comes from a specific block. Yes, um, and to minor correction, it'd be uh, specifying transaction hashes. And so these are vouts, but the VNs up here are describing transaction IDs. And so each of these transactions has a transaction ID associated with it. And so they're they're saying, this is where my inputs come from. Yeah, this is, and then to these addresses are where they're going. I'm gonna call this new transaction. You know, if it was up the top there. Some other transaction ID hash. So to equate this to like a double ledger system, Yes, exactly. Um, and as for things like spreading out, yeah, you can then um, take, you know, a hundred different addresses and then combine them all into one. Um, likewise, you can take one address and split its contents into a hundred different addresses. Um, and because of the domain area size of blockchain, you can really do this. Um, to your heart's content. You won't be able to um, run out of Bitcoin space. Yes? Is there a worry about some sort of EDOS attack on Bitcoin where someone just keeps splitting you know, one Bitcoin over and over down to the limit and everyone has to process those transactions? And so everyone just gets played with I know there's been talk about that, and there's changes in the code to prevent that. Um, I believe it's called dust. 
And you actually see some of that right here. Uh, error except to memory pool non-standard transaction dust. Um, and so there are preventative measures against that. So that was a transaction which was too small to worry about. Probably. Yeah. Okay, we got to fly through the rest. So it happened to you. Dust. Five minutes. Yeah. Okay, so in addition to Bitcoin D, there's a lot of other tools to um, be using on the blockchain. Um, blockchain Explorer is um, it's a website and it's an API for querying transactions. Um, Chain, Gem, Blockstream, and Blockcipher, all are Bitcoin services that provide access to the blockchain and um, additional infrastructure on top of it. For example, you get push notifications every time um, a certain address receives Bitcoin, or a push notification you know, to watch your addresses to make sure no one is spending it. So if you see something happen, you can just like move your Bitcoin right away. Um, blockchain 2.0, a lot of it is centered on the code that is used inside each transaction. And so that was that stack-based scripting languages language um, what blockchain 2.0 is primarily about is taking that language and really open it up while keeping it secure at the same time. So having a Turing complete language where anything is possible and you can have things like smart contracts or one of the um, first ones. And so you could say, you know, when I get paid, um, call, call the door and open it. You know, maybe you have an entrance fee. And so you pay Bitcoin to a certain address, and then that address, when it receives Bitcoin, um, calls another IP address and lets it know, okay, you can open this door. Um, so that's a really simple example. You know, it's it's really up to your imagination what you can do with it. Why do you want a Turing complete language and another Turing complete language? Why do we want a Turing complete language? Uh, just because uh, you can do more with it. Um, <coughs> oh yeah, definitely. Definitely it gets complex. Um, and work on this is a little slower than everybody would like. You know, Ethereum had like, um, you know, uh, they sold about twenty million dollars, I think, worth of Ethereum about a year ago, but it's still not complete. Um, so all these things are possible, but none of them are in release release state yet. Um, because having it torn complete is very hard to show that um, you know it, it's completely secure. Because by having it torn complete, <laughs> exactly what my so comment was. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and so right now it's simple to have that security model, easy to verify. Um, but you can have a lot of other things like. Um, a lottery is another simple example. So everybody submits their Bitcoin to a certain lottery address every 90 minutes, say, uh, randomly selects one of them and deposits Bitco all the Bitcoin that was in there to there. And so you can have these automatic organizations, um, <coughs> programs, anything you want really, whatever, when it's complete, whatever you can dream of. Side chains are pretty cool. This is a picture I stole from Blockstream. Um, so what you have is the blockchain running right here. And so you have it stacking up with blocks. Um, there's a peg point where um, the blocks are pegged with another chain. And so you can run other things like here's a beta release chain. And so you can peg it so that a certain level of this blockchain is tied to a side chain where they can both then go up next to each other. Um, micropayments, research and development. Um, it just allows for more chains to be running at once. Um, other languages, if you want to develop on Bitcoin D or Bitcoin Network, there are all sorts of languages you can use. Here are some of the most popular with JavaScript. You got Bitcoin developed by BitPay, Bitcoin JS, Python, Vitalik Buterin has high Bitcoin tools, Jeff Garzik, Peter Todd, um, both core developers, they have their tools called Python, Bitcoin, they have Python. Well, that's wrong. 
Uh, you got Armory and C Sharp. You have Bitcoin Lib, which is my preferred uh, library, and N Bitcoin. Java, you got Bitcoin J, which is developed by an ex Googler. Um, Bits of Proof and Go, you have BTCD. Uh, Noah, when you said that that's your library, you wrote it or? You no, I didn't write it. Okay. I wrote like a mono Bitcoin D, like wrapper for the RPC calls, okay. but that is a lot more like fleshed out. Uh, you can do hierarchical deterministic wallets, anything, basically. Um, it's, it's kept really well up to date. And it's a full node. Um, security, you have offline wallets to keep your um, private keys secure because if you hold your private keys on your hard drive, unencrypted, um, if anybody hacks into your computer, gets hold of your hard drive, they can have your private keys and they can take your money. So um, you can print out your private key send money to its specified to its associated address and then put it in a safe. And that's the same thing as taking a hundred dollar bill and putting it in your safe. Um, you have multi-sig so that multiple parties have to sign for a transaction to occur. So say you are um, signing for a house and you're gonna put up like fifty thousand um, dollars, maybe you want multiple parties to sign for that much money to go through. So husband and wife both sign, or say um, you have a, so here's something that Qu uh, Quinn Beyond is working on. Um, you have multiple keys needed to process a transaction. And so one of those keys is with Coin Beyond. One of those keys with a, is with another company that does fraud check on it, and then the user has three keys. And this is on a little pin-based device that has a private key on it and never leaves it. Could be NFC. <coughs> and then you have backup keys. And so you say um, for these transactions, they share an address between the five keys. That's a multi-sig address. That, and that multi-sig address is made up of all five of those keys. And then the spend from that multi-sig address, um, in this case, and when you're setting up the address, you specify it, you'd say, I need three of five of these keys in order for funds to be sent. So this is actually one address where the Bitcoin lives and you need three private keys of the five to send it out. So say you're checking out at a terminal, at a point of sale system, you uh, take your card or your NFC device, um, well, merchant rings you up, and then says, well, that'll be 15 bucks. And so you say, okay, I am, you know, my name, I can swipe my card or use my username, and then use this NFC device, put up at the terminal, that transaction data will be sent to your device, so your Bitcoin, your private key doesn't have to leave the device. Then you enter your PIN on that device, it's signed, and then transferred back to the terminal, and then sent out. And then CoinBeyond and the fraud check service validates the transaction, makes sure it's not happening out of pattern, and distributes to the network. And so this signed it, this signed it, and this signed it. And one of the ways that's amazing is, you know, you hear about Mt. Gox, they got hacked, people lost their Bitcoin, it was a central point of failure. This has no central point of failure. Coin Beyond gets hacked, okay, they lost one key. Uh, attacker still needs two keys in order to steal this person's money. Even if both of these companies get hacked, hackers' funds, or this person's funds are still safe. If somebody loses their PIN device, but again, that's just one. Um, but then they also have these backups where they can load it onto their device and then move money out. Who's running the Bitcoin software? All three of them? Um, the Bitcoin software? Uh, you have everybody in the world running the... But uh, all, the, all those keys are running the, the Bitcoin protocol? Uh, they're all part of the Bitcoin protocol, yeah. Sure. Is there any services where people do proxies where they validate in Bitcoin but they don't actually
Are there any services? Um, I guess I'd like say, say you get a credit card with a chip on it, and you denominate it in Bitcoin, but obviously you're not speaking Bitcoin, and you want the bank to do that on your behalf. I think um, Coinbase might be an example. So they do um, Bitcoin payments, yeah. and they hold Bitcoin, but they hold it offline to save money on miner space. Mm -hmm. And so then if you want to pay somebody outside of Coinbase, then they send it back onto the blockchain. Um, so they're denominating in Bitcoin, but they're not actually interfacing with the Bitcoin network, unless they have to. Uh, is that kind of what you meant? That's a little different. Okay. But it's, it's similar that your story, the point is that you, the mon you don't have the money on your own hard drive. They're holding the money for you. That's, that's yes. really what I was talking about. Yeah. Those, there are services that will hold your money for you. Um, and will they give, like, has anybody denominated a credit card in Bitcoin? Uh, Maybe. Some of those, I, I, they're, they're issuing it to like, it's just a small number of people. You can pre-order one for free, I think. Um, I don't remember if you have to pay to sign up, but it's trivial to do. So they basically, they, they recommend Bitcoin and I mean, the magnetic is, is a joke, but the new security is pretty reasonable. But you, you have to have possession of the car in order to do it. The chip, yeah. The, the new chip. Is, there's a lot of problems with the pins and all that stuff, but you do have to have possession of the car. Yeah, I'm aware of the problems. <laughs> um, the Zappo card, I've yet to see anybody with it. It's not the, available uh, in the U.S. The drop down. So Coinbin is a really cool website where you can do multi-sig. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a website, but it's also an offline tool, so you can um, download it, and it's just HTML and JavaScript to set up a multi-sig wallet. Um, there's also to help uh, not lose your keys, because keys are long strings, long strings of letters and numbers. And so you can use a 12-word mnemonic um, and so you, it could be like apple, Jesus, bear, pears, pineapples, <laughs> clock, um, zing, and that could be your password that you remember, and that then translates into your private key. Um, Brain Wallet is a good tool for that. Um, so that was security. Privacy, that's a little different. By default, people don't have privacy on Bitcoin. Um, every transaction, as you saw, you can see. You can look up any transaction. Actually, the NSA and the CIA, they love Bitcoin because it gives them access to so many transactions. There are ways to keep your privacy, though. Um, you can use hierarchical deterministic wallets uh, to use a new address every time. And so, with regular Bitcoin, you use the same address a whole bunch of times. Once somebody knows that's the address you're associated with, um, then they know where you're spending your Bitcoin. With hierarchical deterministic wallets, you have a root that can then create like two billion other keys. And each of those can create two billion other keys. And so all you have to do is remember this one, and then you can deterministically figure out all the other ones. Would it actually give you the private key? Uh, it does if you do it in a certain way. Okay. Um, so you can use this uh, transaction, send it, send the change address to the next address, send the change address to the next address. Um, but then you'd really want to, so this is a this is a good way to not reuse addresses. But then you'd have to really combine it with something like coin drawing, where um, another gentleman brought up um, taking one trend one, one address and its contents and splitting up to 100. Well, coin, coin drawing is a lot like that. Um, and there's mixing services like it. 
where people submit their Bitcoin to an address, and then it takes a Bitcoin from a whole bunch of different people and then shuffles them around. It'll do it um, for several blocks, and then and then you can withdraw your coins from that system, and then they've been they've been scrambled, so they're not directly tiable back to you. So like dark wallet. Yes. Um, yeah. So coins get lost. Yes, they do. It's possible to determine the difference between a coin that's been lost and a coin that's been lost. Right, right, right. But, but there's, I think there's estimates. estimates that are, and then do you know approximately like any idea of those rates? Uh, I don't know the rates, but I think it's between 5 and 10% have been lost. Huh. Yeah. Early days of the network. If you try to do everything manually by yourself, you're very likely to lose coins. i be extra careful with them. If a coin goes inactive for a while, can you just assume that it No, of course not. So. Nope. We're just be it, saving it. Yep. Coin. Could be in. Yes. <laughs> exactly. That's what they're called. But. <laughs> Is it true that, that the address for, or the address for Satoshi Nakamoto has basically been active, inactive yes. since the beginning? Yes. I was just thinking, what if Satoshi never came forward because uh, just lost, like the hard drive failed and lost all that, and it's just too embarrassing. <laughs> well, it really has no impact on the network. There yeah. are fewer coins in the system, but the the network and the, the the bitcoins circulating, actively circulating, are really what give value and worth to things. Yes. Um, and so, that's if, how all fiat currencies work. Yeah, and so if there's about, you know, say, Fifty billion dollars worth of bitcoins in active circulation. Um, it doesn't matter how many bitcoins there are. If there are less, if there are seventeen million bitcoins, each bitcoin just becomes worth more. And because you can divide it into the hundred million, and you can change the code so you can divide it even further, um, it, it, this this limit this this number of bitcoin is quite arbitrary. For the future intergalactic currency. <laughs> yes. You could even do it to the moon. <laughs>